Hi everybody, Professor Wills here, Pasadena City College. Well, we're continuing our examination of Romanesque architecture, and I've got a couple more churches to show you um, that have their own unique characteristics and architectural um, innovations that are really going to propel medieval church architecture, uh, particularly um, lay the ground of work groundwork for what will become the incredible skyscraper-like cathedrals of our um, next subunit about the Gothic world. So um, let's take a look about what I'm talking about. Now where we're going to travel first is to northern France. And I'm going to mention the Vikings, which you're like, why we're in about the 11th century? Why are we talking about the Vikings? Well, the Vikings, um, of course, were, you know, known for their, you know, pirating and invading, but also colonizing not only parts of the British Isles, but northern France as well. So when you hear about that region of northern France called Normandy, um, that's where the Normans in, you know, around this time period in the Romanesque world um, um, lived, and they were essentially um, the descendants of the Vikings who colonized that part of the world. So, um, you know, these Norsemen uh, became European. Um, and um, along with that, a famous name associated with that time of history, William the Conqueror. Um, and at that point, he uh, had a relationship with the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and through success, lines of succession, he believed that he was next in line to become the King of England. Um, and plans changed, uh, just like uh, any tr dramatic family story. Um, and when that uh, crown was denied to him, um, he organized uh, Viking style. An army sailed across uh, from France, uh, across the British or uh, the English Channel, and uh, won uh, a battle against the English claiming the throne. Um, so we'll get into how that will be uh, inspiring to the second church we'll take a look at, Durham Cathedral. Uh, but first, let's take a look at what's happening in Normandy, in Northern uh, France with a cathedral called saint Etienne. So let me get my PowerPoint ready for you here. And um, they say some 25% of all English uh, men and women are descendants of William um, the Conqueror, the first Norman King of England. It's very interesting. All right, and of course we know all know about Prince William. Um, wonder where his name came from. Hmm, all right. <laughs> Okay, let's see here. Just bringing myself up and a little bit in our PowerPoint here, slideshow. Okay, here's what I'm talking about here. Here's Saint Etienne in Caen, France, begun in the year 1067. So we're looking at the west facing facade of this particular church here. And you've got some people and cars there to give you a sense of scale. Um, but what you find is characteristic of Romanesque architecture. Um, and particularly this Norman version of Romanesque architecture in northern France is a sense of orderliness. There's a real balance between verticality of parts and horizont horizontality um, of parts. So looking at this image here, you can see that these um, kind of thicker elements running up the part of the facade of the church are buttresses. They're, they're support elements, much like we saw at Hagia Sophia in our Byzantine unit in Constantinople. Um, but what you find is that they also visually create um, a division of thirds in the facade. So you have one, two, three elements, these sort of rising vertical elements. And of course, on the sides, they continue up to those really incredible bell towers you see uh, flanking the church here. So there's that, there's, a, vert there's a, a sense of verticality in thirds in that way, but also horizontally. So if you look at the bell towers themselves, you can see that they are divided up into three parts or thirds as well. So that kind of counter uh, balances that sense of verticality with a kind of a, a horizontal rhythm that's very visually appealing to the eye because of its sense of orderliness um, and um, organization. All right, moving inside, let's take a look at what's happening in 
Romanesque architecture with Saint Etienne. Now I'm going to make myself disappear here so you can get a sense of all of the uh, information I'm trying to share with you. Um, the image on the left here is a view towards the altar end of the church of Saint Etienne, and of course, I've provided an architectural plan um, to explain <clears throat> what we're looking at. Now, we're not focusing on, <clears throat> excuse me, the altar end of the church or the ambulatory. We're interested in looking at the nave of Saint Etienne because it's here um, at the nave. Um, that you see something called a sexpartite vault. And I've written that uh, term here for you. And basically it means that you have a vault made up of six parts. So if you count here, you've got your you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. That is a sexpartite vault. Um, and what the Normans have done here is created a familiar kind of central um, uh, organization with a nave running down to the altar and side aisles. But for the nave, what they've done is used those familiar compound piers that alternate as you move down the aisle with this um, arcade of arches. And from the springing, you have launched um, these transverse arches. So the compound piers and these, remember the compound arches that we've, or the transverse arches um, that we first met at Saint Cernan, for instance. Um, another example of a slightly earlier Romanesque church in France, um, we met a very similar transverse arch. I talked about it a little bit being like, you know, the inside of a whale, you're looking at the ribs, um, supporting this long barrel vault, kind of tunnel-like barrel vault. What's different going on here at saint Etienne is because they not only use the transverse um, arches to delineate each bay of the nave, but also what they do have installed here is the sex part type vault. And because of this vault type, it allowed an upper level of clear story windows. So again, to flash back to Saint um, Sarnan, there's just a two story elevation here. There is a, an arcade of um, arches flanking the side aisle and then a um, sort of tribune level with some windows letting some light in. But over here at um, the slightly newer Saint Etienne, it's a, it's a three part elevation. So there's um, one, two, three parts. So this is essentially a clear story which allowed um, an additional number of windows, additional light, and then in tandem with the transverse arches and the kind of illusionary aspects of the sex part type vault, you get, a, you get not only more light, more illumination in the church, but also a sense of verticality um, that's um, more convincing than you would have seen at saint Cernan. So thanks to the sex part type vault, um, you get this um, greater connection to the heavens, right? And we've talked about the importance of height or the illusion of height to uh, make you in your faith feel like you're connected to your God, right? So this is what you find happening in, um, among uh, the architects in Norman um, France um, in this Romanesque period of time. Now, looking at the architectural drawing, you can see um, that sex part type vault right here. And again, you can kind of count the pieces of it. It's almost like cutting up your favorite kind of square shaped pizza into your favorite Friday night slices, but there you have it, the sex part type vault. Okay, now moving on, um, what I want to show you as in another example um, of Romanesque architecture it takes us across. Uh, the English Channel, uh, just like William the Conqueror did once upon a time. Um, and not only did he become the King of England and had kind of rule over two domains you know, on the, you know, in England and on the continent, 
But along with that invasion, as we've seen with the flow of peoples throughout ancient history, comes ideas. And so he brings all of these ideas, these Romanesque um, architectural concepts, um, taking churches then to the British, uh, Romanesque aesthetic to the British Isles. And so what do they do with it? Well, they adopt, of course, many of those brilliant concepts, but then of course take it um, in a new direction altogether as well. So what we'll find here almost on the border of uh, present day Scotland is Durham and it's here we're going to meet in Durham, uh, the Durham Cathedral. So moving on here, and of course, um, I talk about in our canvas unit, the, the Boyo Tapestry, which delineates and describes an incredible uh, fabric example of fabric arts, the whole um, uh, Battle of Hastings and William the Conqueror's adventures becoming the King of England. So uh, look for that in your Canvas lessons associated with this unit. But here's a majestic postcard view of Durham Cathedral um, and a sky view, of course, of the same um, cathedral. So very similarly to saint Etienne, we're interested more, um, you know, we recognize many of the Goth the Romanesque features we've talked about so far, but we're more interested on focusing on the nave. So this is both, both our examples of architecture are focus on nave architecture because it's here innovations are being um, born. So what's different about this particular church is you do find compound piers. You can see these almost got, look like attached or engaged columns, um, but they alternate with these beefy pillars. You can see these big, thick columns or pillars, and each one, and I'll show you another slide here, has a different um, uh, design. They, some of them are chevrons, some are zigzags, um, just a phenomenal example of a pattern used to, uh, as a kind of minimalistic decorative element in the Durham Cathedral. Okay. Um, what you also find, um, so we've, we've met the compound pier before, we've seen an arcade of side aisle arches supported by columns or pillars before, that's familiar ground. What's also familiar, of course, is the transverse arch. Now, what's different here at Durham Cathedral is that it's pointed. Um, number one, you can see it's actually pointed um, slightly. This is very important because it's going to trick the eye to think that you're looking at a taller space, but it also channels weight a little bit better um, than a pure arch. And what you find instead of a sex part type vault, you find a true groin vault in seven parts. And so essentially, if I compare this to Saint Cernan, which you can see the familiar barrel vault, kind of tunnel shaped with the transverse arches, um, and then saint Etienne again with the sex type vault. With Durham Cathedral, you have between the transverse arches, you have this sept part type or seven part groin vault delineating each bay um, as your eye moves down um, each bay delineated essentially from um, those beefy pillars um, as they meet. Um, so because of the use of this um, vaulting technique, this ribbed groin vault in seven parts, it's the earliest known example of it, um, it allowed a wider nave, a taller nave, um, and um, therefore, of course, the goal is to get as many people inside the sanctuary as possible. Um, so it's an architectural innovation um, in tandem with something called the quadrant arch. And so if you're wider and taller, that's a lot of weight. We're still looking at stone masonry, guys. It's a lot of heft and weight. How do you channel it instead of directly downward, but down the sides? Well, there's something here called the quadrant arch, um, which becomes the forerunner with that pointed arch and rib groin vault, the future Gothic cathedral wonders we'll study in our next unit. But if I can demonstrate quickly, um, it's a little bit like me resting my elbow here, if I catch it on camera, if I crook my elbow and support my weight on the table in this fashion, 
that is essentially how the quadrant arch works. As that wave pours off 